one last plug to for anybody who's new today, please consider joining the Trinidad Tobago Field Managers Club if you haven't joined yet. Um, it is a really, really great initiative. Um, as I said, lots of talks every month and other other events. So please do consider joining. Us. Um, so thank you guys for hosting me today. And uh, my name is Diva Amon, and I am a deep sea biologist. I recently finished my first postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Hawaii. Um, now I'm currently here working with Dr. Judith Govan on this data set, and hopefully soon I'll be leaving to take up one of two positions that I'm trying to decide between um, elsewhere. So today we're going to take a bit of a journey into the deep ocean, try to give you a little bit of a feel for what we know about the deep sea around from that and Tobago. So, because the deep sea isn't a topic normally discussed in Trinidad, we're going to go right back to the beginning. So we're going to start with, who can tell me what are four characteristics of, about the deep sea? What is the deep sea like? I'll give you a hint. Basically, it should look like this slide if you went down. Anybody? Just shout it out. Just shout it out. It's dark. Number one. Cool. Exactly. Two more. High pressure. What's the last one? No lie. Okay, strange creatures, yes. But so basically, it. No, but okay. So yes, it is cold. The average temperature is about two degrees Celsius in the deep sea, and we consider anything to be deep below 200 meters. It's also extremely high pressure. So with every 10 meters you descend in the ocean, you gain one atmosphere of pressure. So like we feel it now. So there's an easy way that we demonstrate this to people. Basically, we attach styrofoam cups to the vehicles which we send down to depths. And that crushing pressure basically compresses the cups and squeezes all of the air out of them. And then the last one, which you guys didn't get, is that there's not a lot of food. It's an extremely food-scarce environment. And, that, and all of these things have quite large repercussions. So the food, which does get to the deep sea, basically all comes from the sea surface, most of it, the majority, about 98%. And it arrives in the form of dead plankton. So phytoplankton, zooplankton, they basically trickle down into the deep sea and that is how most animals in the deep sea get their food, in the form of dead plankton, dead fe like feces, shells, other things. So as a result, there's just not a lot of food getting down there. So if you were to switch on the lights, this is what your typical plot of deep ocean would look like. This is a picture from the Northeast Atlantic. And this is what, again, most of the deep sea looks like in our, in our world's oceans. As you can see, it's a flat, sedimented plain and you can see there's not a lot of life. There's one urchin tweetering around, maybe a tube worm, but it just doesn't look like there's much going on. And that is because this is just generally a really difficult place to live. So, but don't be fooled, just like on land, we get really a huge variety of habitats in the deep sea. Not everything looks like the previous slide. Instead, you get things like coral gardens, which tend to exist on mountains in the sea called seamounts. And as you can see, they're incredibly colorful and vivid environments that are just really dramatic to look at. There are also things like hydrothermal vents. So these are these small oases habitats, basically, where very chemical-rich hot fluid is expelled from the seafloor, and they create these chimney-like structures. And this chemical-rich fluid is actually the source of energy for these environments, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But it results in this huge abundance of life, which is such a contrast to what the deep sea usually looks like. So those vents on the left are, it's nicknamed car wash for obvious reasons. And that's from the Southern Ocean. This is from the Mariana Trench last year. Um, that was newly discovered, and it was 10 stories tall. And then these are just up the way from the Cayman Trench. So there are also food falls. Food falls. <laughs> there are also food falls. Um, this is again another sort of patchy habitat that occurs in the deep sea, but again, very dramatic to look at. So as I said, it's a really food poor environment. 
And so when you get large bits of food, such as a dead whale or a tree, drifting the hundreds of meters down into the deep sea, you get this sort of feeding bonanza. It's basically like it's Christmas. They are animals that come from all around just to feed on these carcasses. So all of these are from off California. And so you can see the different stages. That's a pretty early stage whale fall, and you can see most of the flesh is still intact. Oh, I have a point to that. Okay, there we go. You can see most of the flesh is still there, and there are also some hagfish feeding. And then we've got two later stage ones where just the bones are left. And you can see there are hagfish and fish still around picking some flesh off the bones. And then we've got this piece of wood here that a tree that probably came out of a river and drifted down to the deep ocean, and it's just absolutely covered in life. And apart from these, we have their trenches, their canyons, their uh, plains, their brine pools, their cold seeps. I mean, the list goes on. It's a really variable place, but still, most of it does look like that first picture. And with this really, these very habitats, you really get a really rich and wonderful and weird fauna. And this is a magnet that I gave to my mom. She has in her fridge. <laughs> And it sort of sums up how life is in the deep sea. If you live down here, you'd look weird too. <laughs> so, just to give you a little taste, these are just some random deep sea animals, I think. We've got, this is known as the hoth crab or the yeti crab, and they live at hydrothermal vents in the Antarctic. And they have a hairy underside, a hairy chest, and basically they farm bacteria on their chest, which they then eat. So it's like they've got a grocery on their body. <laughs> um, then we've got, this was nicknamed the Microsoft Paint Jelly. It was discovered in the Mariana Trench last year. Um, we've got a nudibranch, a sea cucumber, two types of sponges. This one is actually predatory. This fish, which just, I mean, who thinks of this? It's like spotted, it's got some walking fins. It's, it's just generally weird. And then, um, some large, a large snail, and then this is a bone-eating worm, which lives on, it only lives on carcasses in the deep sea. Talk about niche. And it, it uses this root structure to bury down into the bone and extract the collagen from the bones, and that's what it eats. So, a lot of things that really just sort of make you scratch your head. So, another characteristic of the deep sea, which you guys didn't see, is that it's actually really unexplored. It's, it's okay. It's the largest habitat on our planet, and it is also the least known. Up until, it was only in 2014 that the entire world's ocean seafloor was mapped at a resolution of 5,000 meters. Okay, so before that, there were no 100% coverage maps. And so you think, okay, great, fine, that's fine. There's a world map that covers the entire ocean floor. Except think about 5,000 meters. That's like you could lose whole mountains in that place. That's like if Port of Spain, half of it didn't exist. So it really isn't a very resolved or... Basically, there's a lot more work to be done. And with that said, then we also have Mars and Venus. The surfaces of both of those planets have been mapped to a resolution of 100 meters. So we have two other planets that have better maps than our own ocean seafloor. It's just kind of crazy. And so we only have about, I think, the size of Africa, 10 to 15 percent of our world's ocean sea floor is mapped at the same resolution as the surface of Mars and Venus. So you know things to things to improve, but of course mapping doesn't actually equal exploration. Mapping is just showing what the sea floor kind of topography looks like. Exploration is actually getting down there and seeing what the habitats look like, what animals live down there. And so for that, I'd say there's probably less than 0.05% of our world's oceans have actually been explored. So there's just still so much more to find out. And the same can be said for the waters of Trinidad. This is the exclusive economic zone of Trinidad and Tobago. As you can see, we, we actually have quite a, quite a fair chunk of land here. Um, and this line here is made by the, two, is the 200 meter contour. So everything to the right of this, <coughs> is all deep sea, what we would consider to be deep sea. Um, the red is, the deepest point is about nearly four kilometers depth, which is the really deep red. But we can see that more than 
of the land, which can be said to be Trinidad, is actually deep ocean. And yet, we know so little about our deep sea. These green dots are where point samples were taken. It's where, basically, right now, Alana Jude, she is somewhere here, and Judith Gobin and I are working on a project to collaborate, you know, corroborate all the records of deep sea fauna ever collected from within Trinidad's waters. And that's what these green points equate to. And so, it, I mean, you think, hey, that's, that's quite a lot, except when you think everywhere that isn't a green dot, we have no idea what the seafloor looks like there. Absolutely none. And these, most of these points were actually collected using pieces of equipment that didn't actually give us a visual. It was sort of trawling or, or grabs or paws. So it really is just, you know, we're getting a little, little snippet, a little piece of mud, a little animal here or there, and not actually getting a sort of a whole view of what it looks like down there. So let's take a little trip back, historically. The first deep sea sample ever collected in Trinidad's waters was in 1884 by the USS Albatross. It was, this is the first ship dedicated solely to marine research. And we were lucky enough to have it come here. And it threw this net overboard and trawled for a little bit at 1,600 meters depth. And it collected about 200 animals. And those are now housed in the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. Then, since then, for the next 100 years, we've got, hold on, oops, wait, stop. <laughs> so for the, next, for the next 100 years, we've got pretty much sampling like that, trawling, grabbing, box coring, coring of various descriptions. But again, not much else happening. And, and again, not a lot of it at the same time. So I'm just gonna quickly digress for a second and say that Trinidad and Tobago is actually tied to deep sea exploration in another way. Um, so many of you in this room are familiar with this man, Dr. William Beebe, and he was actually the first person and the first scientist to ever go down into the deep sea. He went down in this, it's called the bathysphere. He did the dive off of Bermuda. He did several dives off Bermuda, and for a long time he held the record as the person who did the deepest dive in the world. Um, and I think it was down to about 923 meters before his colleague Otis Barton took over it. So, um, and of course, we know that after he did this, he then came to Trinidad and set up the similar research station, which was then donated to Ace Wright Nature Center. I'm sorry if that's wrong, tell me. But donated to Ace Wright and still functions today. And he also died here and is buried in Mukarapu Cemetery. So it's just a really interesting, you know, connection that Trinidad has to the history of deep sea exploration. So continuing on, so we had a hundred years of grabs and trolls and not a lot of insight apart from an animal here day. And then in the 1980s, we had a group of French scientists decide to come over here. So at this point, the first chemosynthetic habitat, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, had been discovered, the first set of hydrothermal vents in 1977. And this was a huge breakthrough in biology in that it was the first ecosystem ever found to exist independently of the sun and solar energy and plants, I guess. And so the French deep sea, deep sea exploration was pretty trendy at that time, there's a lot of money in it. And the French thought, hey, we know that cold seeps, for instance, are, or these chemosynthetic habitats are known to occur in places where there are accretionary prisms. So when the North American plate okay, subducts below the Caribbean plate, we get the island arc, which is how the Caribbean islands formed, right? So this is the Caribbean island chain going up here. And then you've also got this sort of off scraping, which you can see a little better here. And that's called an accretionary prism. And there's one which exists in the waters of Trinidad, Barbados, and Venezuela, and it's called the Barbados Accretionary Prism. And so this area is, accretionary prisms are known to host, well, they're known to have oil and gas, and then as a result, they're known to host methane seeps, or cold seeps. And so the French thought, hey, this looks like a pretty good spot to go, go study. Let's take a little wander down there. And so they brought their submersible, which can hold three people, the Nautil, and in 1984, I think, 
went down to, they did, they did work in all three islands, waters, Barbados, Venezuela, and Trinidad. Venezuela's on an island, but anyway. And, um, and then when they were there, they did work between 1,000 and 2,000 meters depth, and they found, they were looking for environments that basically run on chemosynthesis. So I'll quickly explain this, sorry to throw jargon in, but we all know what photosynthesis is, right? We all learned that in school. It's basically when green plants are the basis of a food chain, they use solar energy to create organic compounds by combining carbon dioxide and water. And that's how we are here today, and we can function and eat and have oxygen. But of course, in the deep sea, there is no light, and there are no plants as a result. So either animals rely on that food drifting down, or in little pockets of the deep sea, they use chemosynthesis. So for instance, that hydrothermal vents, cold seeps, whale falls, wood falls, and other places. So what that is, is instead of having green plants as the basis of the food chain, you have bacteria. And instead of using solar energy as your energy source, they use chemical energy. And so this chemical energy is usually found in fluids which seep out of the seafloor or are expelled really violently, like at hydrothermal vents. And they have methane, they have sulfides, and those are used by the bacteria to create organic compounds in a similar way to which plants do from solar energy. And so that is basically what hydrothermal vent and cold seep ecosystems run off of. And that will be very pertinent in the next few slides. So the French, they went down in Nautil and they found cold seeps. Woo! So what is a cold seep? It's basically where, because of tectonics, there are fissures and gaps not gaps, gases, sorry, and fluids, uh, they seep out onto the seafloor. So that will have methanes and sulfides, as I just said. And then those methanes and sulfides are used as the energy source, and, it, and it's a really plentiful energy source. And so it means that there's a lot of animals that then basic, basically sort of aggregate around these areas where the seepage is. And because it's seeping up through sediments, it can be pr a pretty substantial area. So when the French came, they found quite extensive communities, mostly dominated by bivalves, so two muscle species oh. and a clam species. Um, and then they also found some chew worms and I think some shrimp when they came. But because it was a submersible, a submersible expedition, it means that only the people in the sub can see what, what is out there. And of course they took videos, but then it went to France and then it never really made it back to the Caribbean, I guess. And then that was kind of it for deep sea exploration for the next, again, 30 years. There's just not really a lot going on in Trinidad, necessarily, because deep sea exploration is expensive, it's time consuming, and it's really uh, difficult to do in general. Um, so that was until October 2014 when Dr. Judith Gilbin and I, uh, Dr. Judy works at the University of Westerners, I'm sure a lot of you know, um, we were invited aboard the EV Nautilus, which is run by the Ocean Exploration Trust, to go and explore the deep sea off Kickham Jenny Grenada and off Trinidad and Tobago. And the Nautilus does this using a two vehicle system. First, they have a towed camera sled, which sits above the remotely operated vehicle, which sits below. And the purpose of the towed camera sled is to decouple the movement from, from the sea surface. So it means that the ROV can stay nice and steady and get really, really good imagery. So, and the ROV is sort of the workhorse. We can control where it goes from on the ship. It has manipulators to collect samples. And I'm talking about like really delicate manipulators. You can collect corals and squishy things. And then we've got lights and cameras so that we can see everything that it's seeing loads of different sampling tools, so vacuum cleaner type things that can suck up animals and cores and it's temperature probes, it's got everything. So that was what would be our eyes into the deep sea. So I'll just tell you a little bit about life at sea. So this is the, it'll be going on in the background, this is the recovery of Hercules, the, um, the ROV. And so what happens is 
Ship time is really expensive. Um, it costs a lot to run a ship, and so it means that there are 24 hour ops. You don't have to stop. We work in shift patterns, so on this particular cruise, we worked two four hour shifts. So for instance, it would be eight to four in the morning and eight to four in the evening. Uh, sorry, not eight to four, eight to 12. And uh, once the ROV is in the water, you have a team which sits in the control van. In the front row, there'll be the pilots, three pilots. One controls the camera sled, one controls the ROV, and one navigates. And then in the back row, you'll have three scientists. And this ship is unique in that it also does a lot of science communication. So it has one science communicator in the control van, and also one person who does the light adjustments and the, and the video zooms and other things. So once the ROV is in the sea, uh, people are there, but then once it gets on deck like this, you can see sample containers here, and then there was a sample container down here, and then there are push cores here. Once it gets on deck, everybody rushes outside like it's Christmas, because there are samples in the box that you want to get a hold of and go and start to study. So everyone runs outside, gets the samples as quickly as possible, because a lot of them are temperature sensitive, of course, um, and it's important for them for us to work on them before they start degrading. So where did we go on this expedition? I'm not going to talk about the Grenada stuff, but we'll do the short announced stuff. And so we went to this area called El Pilar. The French called it El Pilar. And we visited four sites. So these pins here are where the French went in the 80s. And so we visited two of them, this one and this one. This track here, the, these three tracks, this one, and then this yellow one, and then this blue one, are where our, our, our ROV went. And so we visited this site, which the French had been to, this site where the French had been to, and then two new sites, these two here. And we chose these two new sites based on, during our mapping operations, because when the ROV isn't in the water, we map the seafloor, because as I said, there aren't detailed maps. And whenever a research vessel is at sea, it's always collecting map data, always, which it gives to the wider community as well. So we chose these two these two targets because when we're mapping, we can actually pick up bubble streams, and those bubble streams, in this case, are indicative of cold seeps. And so we picked up loads and loads of bubble streams in a very small area um, that we managed to survey, but we chose the two largest, two, I guess, strongest of the bubble streams and decided to go visit those. So what did we find? Well. I'm not, this video is quite long, so I'm not going to talk over the whole thing. But, so when you're going down, it's descent. Depends, you can see blue for up to four hours, but in this case it was only about 1,400 meters depth, so it was about an hour and a half of descent. And then you hit the sea floor, and you can see the tool tray in front of the RV. And so then we hit the sea floor, and it was magnificent. There were just mussels as far as the eye could see. And I have here, which I'll pass around as well, a mussel shell. So there are two species of mussel at the site. That's the smaller of the two, and you can see it's already bigger than the commercial mussels we eat. Um, so yeah, so these are all mussels here, and then we've got chew worms sticking up here. These are sponges, um, and just really, I don't know, I felt really proud in that moment when we saw this. And what was really exciting was this, white blob here. It was something that I'd never seen before as well as Judy. And basically it's called methane hydrate. And those bubbles are what we were able to pick up when we were mapping to indicate where the seep was, which is amazing. And it's trapped underneath that ledge. And because of the really high pressures and really low temperatures, it basically forms methane hydrate. And that's when water, water molecules surround the methane model molecules and it forms this sort of ice-like structure. Looks like a snow cone. And this is something which isn't really seen very often. It's only seen in the deep sea and it's only seen at, in permafrost. And so that was really, really exciting for us. Um, so we can also see there's some shrimp, okay, dotted in between. You can see some his antennae there. These are the mussels that are passing around the shell um, with their gills <coughs> extended. And again, compared to the picture I showed you of the Northeast Atlantic, you can see there's just a huge amount of life compared to what the deep sea normally looks like. And that's because it's just got this sort of 
you know, really prolific food source. So here you can see these are uh, mussels, mapping audio's mussels, with albinocari shrimp dotted in between them. Every now and again you'll see a squat lobster, and there's some fish around. So we took some temperature measurements, which is what's happening here, and the highest temperature we got was about 32 degrees. And so it's kind of like bath water these animals are sitting in. And at all of the sites we visited, this is what it looked like. Just fields, endless fields, as far as you could see, as far as the light would let you see of mussels. And when they weren't live mussels, they were dead mussels. That's what all these shells are here. Um, so this was about 1,400 meters depth, so 1.4 kilometers depth. And there were lots of baby mussels. All the gold you can see are baby mussels, as well as there were lots of juveniles of various species, which I guess is a good sign. We can go on. So, and there was actually some methane hydrate that formed on the RV, which was, again, something that we hadn't seen before when we were down there. But on the way up, it, um, becomes, it goes back into solution, and yeah, you don't see it. So, next slide. So what, so what are some of the main components of the community? These are what we'd call cold seep endemics, and they're animals that live nowhere else other than at cold seeps. And many of them live nowhere else other than cold seeps in the Atlantic Caribbean region. So first we've got some, as you saw, the Bathymodulus mussels. They are the most conspicuous of all the animals. Um, here, just in the millions. I mean, I think we, we looked at, in a meter squared, there were about a thousand of them. So think about that for hundreds of meters. That's a lot, a lot of mussels. Um, and as I said, there was lots of recruitment going on. You could see baby mussels everywhere, and that indicates that this is a this is a thriving community in like you know the peak of its life. And then we've got also the other species of Bathymodiolus, and this is known as Bathymodiolus boomerang because the shell actually has a pink in it, like a boomerang, and it's humongous. So. <laughs> This is it compared to my head. And I think we, these were some found off Trinidad. You can just see, they were very rare in the waters of Trinidad. You can see one live one there, 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 whereas all these are dead shells of the Bathy Modulus. And so that could be like a community shift happening. We're not really quite sure yet, but off Grenada, we collected these ones. And we actually collected the largest <coughs> specimen ever recorded. And that was 36.5 centimeters in length. Think about that, that's a muscle. <laughs> so then we've also got these chew worms, which are one of my favorite animals. Um, they're just so weird. And there's a chew worm to pass around. This is the shell of a chew worm. Please be careful. Um, and so chew worms are similar to mussels in that, okay, I didn't say it. Mussels don't have guts. Instead, they have the bacteria, chemosynthetic bacteria that we talked about earlier, in their gills. And so there is no need for them to eat. They literally have bacteria which just convert the chemicals in, right in them into food. And so that's how they get most of their nutrition. And it's the same for these chew worms, except they don't use methane like the mussels, they use the sulfides. And so the root, which you'll see in the one passing around, is really, really thin and curly. And that extends down into the sediment. And that acts like a tree almost, roots, tree roots, and it sucks up sulfides. And then it gets its oxygen from the red plumes. It has hemoglobin, just like us. And, uh, and it has a, a specialized organ which contains all of these sulfur-loving bacteria. And that's how this gets its food. It doesn't have a mouth, it doesn't have an anus, it doesn't have a digestive tract, nothing. That is how it functions. And then you can also see there's some snails around, a bryozoan, coral. Just the community was definitely dominated by a few animals, but also very, very diverse when you sort of looked in between. And then one of the other main components were the albinocara shrimp. <coughs> These were everywhere, almost as prolific as the mussels. Um, and it's thought that they are either predatory or scavengers. They don't rely on chemosynthesis. And then we've got Pachycara caribium. It's this adorable eel pout fish, <laughs> which was actually only discovered well, no, described and named last year, Pachycara caribium. Um, and it was, this, it was described from this site, as well as the Cayman Trench hydrothermal vents. And it's the first fish from this group 
to have been found at both vents and seeps. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but again, it's one of the new discoveries that has already made it into publication, I guess. But is that a present? It eats and has got. Pardon? So, yeah, so this. So this one is, it's known, we found some in the Cayman Trench, and when we CT scanned them, they had shrimp in their tummy. Oh, please. So they eat, <laughs> as you can see, they've got a lot of shrimp around, so they're not gonna go hungry. <laughs> um, and they tend to like waters between about five and 20 degrees Celsius, so again, they're not in the, in the hottest parts of the sea, but they're, they're around in the, in the lukewarm bath water. And then we've got also these sort of rarer, more opportunistic animals. So just like, I'm sorry, wait, we'll stop, stop. Okay, just continue, it's fine. So unlike the, the endemics, you've got these animals, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> you've got these animals which sort of drift into the habitat when they want, they can pick off some animals, there's some predation, and then they can go back their way, such as this chimera, which is, again, one of my favorite animals, just because it's so weird. It's also known as the rabbit fish, the rat fish, the spook fish, the ghost shark, and they're predominantly deep sea. Their closest living relatives are sharks and rays, but they diverged from those about 400 million wow. years ago. As you can see, nothing happens quickly in the deep sea. So <laughs> this is as fast as it goes. It also has a poisonous spine on its dorsal fin. This one has parasites. You can see that is a bit, that white thing is a huge parasite on its back, and that might be one there as well. And when you look at its snout, when it turns around, you'll see that its whole snout is a sensory organ. You'll see the sort of papillae moving along the snout. And um, that's because, of course, there's no light down here, and that's how it finds its food. Is he blind? Uh, it has eyes. I assume it has some kind of seeing capability. It definitely is blind now, because the ROV lights would not have done it any good. Um, but, and you can see that, so that's his mouth, and those are the sensory organs. Is that the actual speed? Pardon? Is that the actual speed? Yes, that is the actual speed. There is no alteration there. Everything happens slowly in the deep sea. So then we've also got, there are various species of crabs and squat lobsters. This one was sitting down munching on a mussel. Um, and you can see there are also little amphipods that were swarming around like flies, trying to eat the little scraps of, of meat, mussel meat that were going. Um, and then we've got some other more vagrant species that kind of came in when they felt and left when they didn't. But most of those would be predatory. So all the dead mussels are because of crabs, you think? No. So what may, don't switch the slide. So what probably happens is these environments, cold seeps, are transient. So that, that fluid flow can switch off and wane. It can wane and then switch off. And so as a result, the mussels need the strongest flow and so as it starts to wane, many of the mussels may die, and, or it may switch places and so on. So it results in this sort of life or death happening in a blink of an eye kind of thing, I guess. Um, but when they do die, there are crabs to pick them off, and I'm sure they also, there is some degree of predation as well. What's the kind of pressure of this depth for animals to be existing? So this is about 1400, 1500 meters depth, and so that means that it is 150 times what we're feeling right now. <laughs> it's not an easy place to live. So, moving on, again, this is the next animal, is one of my most favorite animals as well that we saw. We saw about five of these, um, and we're not sure the exact species, but it is adorable and purple, and it's known as the Grinellidon octopus. And these are all sponges. These are all sponges around it. Um, and again, you'll see slow movements because it's deep sea. This is all real time. Oh, not real time. Live. Not live. Real time. And um, so, an interesting fact is we're not sure which species this is. We know it's the genus Grinellidon, but a, 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 a species from off California of the same genus Grinellidon in 2014 was actually found to have the longest brooding period of any animal on the planet. So mothers in the audience, brace yourselves. It was actually found to have, to brood its eggs for four and a half years. And it never left the eggs in that time and never ate in that time. So basically what happens is it just stays with the eggs, constantly fanning them, cleaning them. And over time, well, we, the scientific team said over time, 
you could see it getting like whiter and looking a little bit more bedraggled and just generally like, less and less lively, I guess. And um, by the time they hatched, the mother would have died. And that is pretty much how they, their reproductive strategy, I guess it works. Do they feed off of their mother's corpse? I do not know. <laughs> but that is quite morbid. <laughs> But um, we saw a couple of these in the crevices uh, around, but they are really, really adorable. Um, and they're probably pred predators of some kind, eating mollusks, maybe, and other things. But I don't unlikely. Know it's an but why are we seeing brittle stars? Shouldn't they be all over the place? So there are brittle stars at this site, but they are very tiny, as are a lot of the animals. They're in between the muscles and so on, sort of centimeter size. Um, and I guess it's just their brittle stars aren't the dominant animals here. They do exist, but just not well, large. The deep sea floor is just being carpeted with, with brittle stars. So that is the case in, in areas where that's sedimented. So the, the first picture I showed in the Northeast Atlantic, you'd get a lot more brittle stars there. And that's because they're just deposit feeders that, you know, siphon through the mud and, and eat as they're going. Whereas here, it's a really specialized environment where you've got animals thriving that use the methane. And the brittle stars aren't. Some that do that. So as a result, they're outcompeted. <laughs> so how big would this guy be? Uh, so usually there are lasers on, but because the Nautilus, like two laser pointers that are 10 centimeters apart, but because the Nautilus prides themselves on getting amazing footage, you they, they turn them off most of the time. But I mean, maybe like that big? Not very big. Everything, it's like a rule. Everything in the camera looks a lot bigger than it actually is. And that was really disappointing to me as a marine bio as a deep sea biologist. You're like, oh my god, I can't wait to like handle this sea cucumber. And then it comes up and it's like this thing. <laughs> so yeah, something you get used to. And then we've also got um, another really exciting animal that went viral because I forgot to say that the Nautilus, one of the things they pride themselves in is that they use something called telepresence where basically everything that the ROV is seeing, the remotely operated vehicle is seeing, is all being streamed live on the internet. There are two ships in the world that do that currently, the Nautilus and the Oceanus Explorer, and they're both about to begin their field seasons for this year. So it's just something really interesting to watch on an evening if you're bored and there's nothing on TV. You can pretty much just watch deep sea TV, and it's great. <laughs> so it went viral, um, a siphonophore. And so many of us in the room probably know the most common siphonophore for us to know is the Portuguese man -o And so this is a deep sea relative. And the interesting thing about siphonophores is that it's not one animal, it's actually a colony of animals. And uh, each, each individual is specialized to do, well, you have groups of individuals specialized to do certain functions. So it very much is like a community <coughs> that operates to, for the benefit of this one being as such. It's just a really interesting animal. And then we've also got these uh, corals, which were sort of around the periphery of the, of the seeps. Um, they don't rely on the, on the fluids or the seeps in any way, but they find them very easy places to live. Because of the activity and because of the amount of bacteria um, around, it means that these, which are suspension feeding, so filter feeding, they take particles from the water column. It means that they have a plentiful food source and it means they can thrive it. So you get these quite large corals um, that then create habitats for other animals. So here you can see this one has brittle stars, about 10 of them probably or more living on it. And then this one's got a squat lobster, a brittle star, and an anemone. An <laughs> an <laughs> um, so and these corals can actually, they're, they're very long lived. Um, they're, I think some similar to this one, this primnoid here were found off Hawaii um, last year, and they were, I think, some of the oldest animals alive. I think they were about 3,000 years old. So, I mean, again, there's a lot more work to be done here, but it just shows that there are pretty vulnerable animals here that grow really slowly, and um, I guess, should be careful. All these images are from the All these images are from the study. Yeah, so apart from the first like five slides, all of the ones that I've shown you in the last 15 slides have all been from Trinidad, yeah. From those four sites to the east of Trinidad, they're about 150 kilometers 
to the east of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so we're still at a really early stage of analysis here, but so far we can say that there were at least 44 species, but that number is probably going to go up exponentially as we start actually analyzing the video. Um, and about 20 of those have not been previously recorded in Trinidad waters, and that number definitely will go up. We have samples to work through, and we have, I think, four days of imagery to go through. Um, and then I'm sure some of these are going to be new species. Every time you do work in the deep sea, you find a new species. Like, it's not uncommon. Um, and it just highlights how much more there is to learn about our deep oceans, especially in Trinidad. And again, I said we saw lots of recruitment, lots of young shrimp, shrimp of different ages, lots of young mussels, lots of egg sacs on rocks. And again, that shows that at least the four sites we visited are all thriving. They're all communities which are at the peak of their life and, and are recruiting babies and larvae from elsewhere or from there to come back and, and survive. So, of course, our economy is run on oil and gas, and this is again the EEZ of Trinidad. And here it's divided up into <laughs> lease blocks. Each of these colored blocks are blocks that are already leased off to a company. So I think this one is BH Peopleton, maybe. But it just shows that this year or next year, they're supposed to be the first deep water uh, oil well drilled off Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and this will be the first time that's ever happened, and it will be right here in the vicinity of all of this. So, of course, our studies have implications, and currently there is no legislation in place about how to, you know, manage the two very contrasting um, things, whether, whether it's beautiful wildlife, um, a huge diversity, or extracting the oil and gas, which we need as a country to grow and prosper. So, it's, where are we gonna go from here? Basically, we, Judy and I, are gonna continue our scientific analyses this year. Um, we're hoping to produce about three papers, at least, scientific papers. Um, and we've got, again, lots to work through. Then, there's also now a big push for a lot of public engagement. So there'll be more talks like this, and recently, this weekend, you, some of you may have seen, there was a press release about Nehurst coming on board with this project. And basically, they're going to produce a five, five educational DVDs, which will then begin circulation in our nation's schools. And also a photo book, which again, will, will go to national libraries and libraries and schools and so on. Um, all to just try and raise awareness, because we have a really bad marine education I guess there's, there's not much marine education here, um, or environmental education at that. And so the deep sea just really isn't on anybody's radar, and it really should be, because as we said, it was about 50% of our, of our land, of our area as a country, is occupied by deep ocean. And with time going on, humans are pushing more and more into the deep sea. As we saw, we're going to begin oil and gas exploration and exploitation in the next year or two. Then also there's deep fisheries are pushing deeper and deeper. There's now possible deep sea mining that may happen in the future for metals. And so we as a world are using our deep oceans more and more. And so it's important that we know what's there in order for us to be able to manage and protect it properly. Um, so we're hoping in 2018 and 2019, Nautilus and the Okeanos Explorer, the two telepresence ships, are going to be passing back through the Caribbean, and we're hoping that we'll be able to peg on some more time to do some more exploration. We already have those bubble stream targets, so it would be pretty easy to you know, just get down there. And So we're really hoping that comes off, and if we do, I'm sure you'll hear about it in the news and so on. Um, because it really is just about knowing what's there before we can sort of sustainably manage it. Um, and then in the long term, We'd also like to revise the national policy to, do, to ensure that basically we, we can manage our resources because these are resources at the end of the day. Not only are deep sea animals used for things like biotechnology, I mean there's cancer drugs coming out of the deep sea, there's enzymes used in washing powders, there's uh, enzymes used in, in blood transfusions, there's all kinds of stuff. Um, but 
So as a result, it's important that we sort of balance the two, you know, that that extractor extraction of oil and gas and also the preservation of what is a huge wealth of diversity in the oceans off of Trinidad and Tobago. And so with that said, <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs>